He'll come for me. He's tried before, many times with many three-eyed ravens. The second episode of season 8 gave us a crucial scene that finally explained what the entire Game of Thrones fandom has been wondering about for years now, what the Night King is after, and on a deeper level, what his quest represents. He wants to erase this world, and I am its memory. The endless night that the Night King aims to bring to Westeros is translated for us by Bran and Samwell Tarly as the destruction of all living memory. Well, that's what death is, isn't it? Forgetting. This scene pretty much dismisses the widespread fan theory that Bran is the Night King, but it also explains why that theory was so persuasive to some. There's a deep link between Bran and the Night King. His mark is on me. He always knows where I am. The two are mirrors of one another. One is memory, and the other is forgetting. So let's linger on this for a moment and unpack what it really means. If the Night King's forgetting equates with death, then the series is saying memory is life. I can see everything. Everything that's ever happened. To everyone. In fact, memory is a good definition of what separates the army of the dead from the army defending Winterfell. The Night King's whites are reanimated corpses who have the basic hallmarks of life, they can move and pose a very grave threat to the living, but they have no knowledge of who they are or what they've seen. If we forget where we've been and what we've done, we're not men anymore. Just animals. Through this theme, the series is getting somewhat meta, as we are all engaged in watching an exercise in preserving humankind's memory. This story is loosely inspired by medieval history, as well as classics of literature and fantasy. Most fundamentally, it's trying to pass down to us the deeper lessons history has taught us about power, love, survival, and the bigger picture. But before you leave, you must learn. Learn what? everything. This sentimental gathering on the eve of the battle against death itself reminds us that if we don't preserve this shared better self, we don't just lose life, we've lost what makes life valuable. So in this crucial scene revealing Bran's ultimate importance, the show subtly announces its own ambition to bring us closer to that precious font of memory, because stories that contain the truth are the key to making us alive in a real sense. Your memories don't come from books. Your stories aren't just stories. If I wanted to erase the world of men, I'd start with you. In light of this message, it makes sense that the rest of this episode is about ghosts and the memories and truths these ghosts carry with them. Near the end, we get a melancholy song from Brienne's squire, Podrick. And she never wanted to leave. Never wanted to leave. And it feels like the lyrics are speaking about passionately wanting to live, not wanting to leave this life, which is here deeply intertwined with wanting to remember. I remember the first time we were here. First time I saw this hole. The first line of this song, Jenny of Old Stones, comes from the books, while the rest was written for the show. The lyrics tell of a young woman dancing with ghosts. Jenny would dance with her ghosts. And as the army of the dead gets ready to strike, it's as if all of our characters' ghosts are present at Winterfell, symbolically in formation ready to pounce on the living. The episode ends with Jon telling Daenerys the secret he's dreaded bringing to light. My real name is Aegon Targaryen. And just like his conversation with Samwell, again this painful moment of truth happens in a crypt. So it's as if the truth itself comes from our ghosts below ground. Though it remained buried a long time, it's still there ready to rise again. The way that each character reacts to truth in this episode is symbolic. Daenerys responds to Jon's information with anger. It's impossible. We see this Targaryen rage coming out of her more and more when she doesn't get her way. If you can't help me, take it back. I'll find another hand who can. And here we might notice that Jon lies to protect Sam from Danny's wrath. Who told you this? Bronn. He saw it. He saw it? And Samwell confirmed it. So even this incredibly trusting man who loves her fears that she will rush to fury before fair judgment. Danny's first response is, predictably, skepticism. A secret no one in the world knew, except your brother and your best friend. 
But John isn't interested in wasting time on denial. It's true, Donnie. I know it is. And this look he gives her before they're interrupted betrays a disappointment that her first instinct is a selfish and defensive concern for her claim. You'd have a claim to the Iron Throne. If the incestuous implications aren't the main issue here, then she's also not being logical. If they got married, two claims are better than one. A proposal is what I'm proposing. So the fact that she assumes there's a need to compete and wants to be the sole primary ruler underlines a key difference between the two as leaders. In the next week's scenes, we hear Sansa say, The most heroic thing we can do now is to look the truth in the face. True to form, the unfailingly decent and dutiful John faces the truth with a reluctant, mournful acceptance. But Danny has become so attached to a particular narrative of herself, All my life I've known one goal. The Iron Throne. That she's resisting any evidence that contradicts her narrative. And this impulse to strong arm the facts is the hallmark of rulers who abuse their power. Someday, you'll sit on the throne and the truth will be what you make it. Meanwhile, Tyrion, despite his recent faltering, reminds us again why he's the smartest of our central characters. You're here because of your mind. Because he enthusiastically steps up to welcome the truth with open arms. You've had a strange journey. Stranger than most. I'd like to hear about it. This moment epitomizes Tyrion's devotion to making knowledge his best friend, to attempt to know the full story. It's a long story. If only we were trapped in a castle, in the middle of winter with nowhere to go. And we can only wonder what useful insights he may have gleaned from this off-screen conversation. Meanwhile, we see Jaime forced to face his truth publicly, as he's put on trial by a collection of his former enemies for his many past sins. When I was a child, my brother would tell me a bedtime story about the man who murdered our father. Jaime's more recent good deeds save him from death. You vouch for him. I do. You would fight beside him. I would. Yet, crucially, Jamie stands behind his so-called sins because he did them for the right reasons. Everything I did, I did for my house and my family. I'd do it all again. Thus, the Raven's line to Jamie, The things we do for love. Is not just a veiled nod to Jamie's attack on Bran. The things I do for love. But also an unironic statement. Jamie really did do it all for love. And that's why, even in his haughtiest early days, he was so likable. No matter what you do, you're forsaking one vow or another. He did terrible things honestly, not letting himself off with self-deception like other characters do. What were you thinking? I was thinking of us. You're a bit late to start complaining about it now. As Tyrion says of Jamie's love for Cersei, She never fooled you. You always knew exactly what she was. You loved her anyway. In this scene, Bran chooses not to share Jamie's greatest sin of all with the group. Why didn't you tell them? So while we're seeing this moral that one must face the truth, at the same time the Three-Eyed Raven demonstrates a complementary wisdom. If you are far smarter than the limited minds around you, there's a value to being selective about the truths you reveal, as a superior intellect understands how pieces of the truth influence human behavior. You won't be able to help us in this fight if I let them murder you first. On the theme of ghosts, this episode also returns to three different unresolved loves who have been haunting one another. The reunited Arya and Gendry finally act on their feelings. We're probably going to die soon. I ought to know what it's like before that happens. In their time apart, both have solidified their identities as fighters. Are you going to be down in the crypt? No, but... But you're a fighter. Now they try to put on a brave face for this battle. He's got many faces. I look forward to seeing this one. But after their love scene, we even see Arya's fearless mask drop for just a moment as she contemplates the war against death itself. Sansa and Theon reunite at the place they once escaped together. And the intensity of feeling between them sends an interesting message about how living through terrible things can bring people together. Your name is Theon Greyjoy, last surviving son of Balon Greyjoy, Lord of the Iron Islands. Do you hear me? Despite what Theon did to the Starks, his brave sacrifice in rebelling against his terrifying abuser gave Sansa life. I'll know them away. No, I won't make you that. These two ultimate victims are the only ones who understand the trauma each other endured. Can't be any worse. You can. 
it can always be worse. And they've come through that experience with a stronger than ever sense of self and purpose. If Sansa is in love with Theon, and if Arya were to get pregnant by Gendry, this would be an interesting reversal of where we expected each Stark girl to end up. Sansa wanted to be a traditional lady who mothered lords. I love him, and I meant to be his queen and have his babies. Seven hells. But Theon can't father any children thanks to... I'm not killing you. Just making a few alterations. Arya once dismissed the idea of motherhood. That's not me. Yet she's become so confident in her own skin that we saw her take control of her first sexual experience with the daring that defines her. I'm not the Red Woman. Take your own bloody pants off. And we can imagine her taking on parenthood with the same sense of agency and lack of concern of doing it the usual way. Meanwhile, if Gendry and Arya's night together does produce a Baratheon Stark heir, that could ultimately complicate lines of succession for the Iron Throne. But that's a major if, relying on certain people not surviving, and Arya avoiding the tragic fate of the aunt she so reminds people of, Lyanna Stark. The greatest love story of this episode is that of Jamie and Brienne, and their romance with knighthood itself. Arise, Brienne of Tarth, a knight of the Seven Kingdoms. We have a whole video coming up about Brienne, so we'll be digging more into this there. How do you know there is an afterwards? Hi guys, it's Susanna and Deborah, and we are The, the Take. Take. If you like what we're doing and you're new here, please subscribe.